Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. Good morning on Tuesday, May 11th. So I noticed the date. <clears throat> I believe that's one of the days, if you look through the Deutsche Bank trader transcripts, um, <laughs> that was one of the days they were smashing the price. Just remember that from one of the many videos I've made about the fascinating silver market. Although today, as I am still in Arizona, you can see my lovely backdrop behind me. Uh, kind uh, Arcadian has given me this beautiful home to stay in for a couple of days here before I head back and pick up Silver Dog. We're going to fire up the hot tub. Great place to think about silver. Um, also, I might add that when you trade from the hot tub, you generate additional alpha that non-hot tub investors miss out on. So there is that. And then there's also my watching this price movement. I've checked this silver chart once or twice in my day. Um, yeah, now maybe a better question, is the CFTC watching the price movement? And as Paul Sarnoff the Great will point out, let's take a look when this one was actually written. I think it was, 1979 or 1980. What an incredible book. All right, copyrighted 1980 by Paul Sarnoff. <laughs> Again, I'll leave up some of his other titles if anyone is curious about his credentials as we uh, dig into this one. Not going to be a terribly long video, but I mean, I just keep reading through this book and it's incredible some of the things that have been going on. Um, let's see, where's my page I had earmarked? Yes, because fortunately we have chapter, so chapter one was the silver longs. Chapter two was the silver shorts. I mean, makes sense. And then uh, chapter three is the silver regulators, which this book is incredible so far. And I don't know, maybe I'm just picking up on these things now, but it's quite fascinating when you actually read books. And I would say that even midway through my trading career, I actually got a book about Barry Bonds and the whole steroid thing. But I remember that got me reading again. And it's just fascinating as I'm going through these. Here's the other one by the lawyer of, from the Hunt Brothers. And, and let, me, let me throw a little uh, brain buster your way. Wait, take a guess who actually brought the case against the Hunt Brothers. If you're thinking it was the U.S. government like I was, you would be mistaken. And <laughs> I'll make a video covering that because I certainly, it's incredible to me how some of these things are relevant. I'm also wondering if Jeff Curry's lawyer will read these books and have the legal and historical precedent um, when hopefully one day we uh, get that one in a courtroom. Could you imagine the Jeff Curry trial? Interestingly, I've noticed he has still not been on CNBC, at least posted on YouTube, since I left him a voicemail. Uh, I'm not saying there's a direct cause and effect, but anyway, enough of the comedy. Let's get to the, the highlights. I mean, where to begin? First of all, if you look up top there, the last sentence of the first paragraph, I'll put my finger there. The CFTC, it was created, was a sunshine agency scheduled to self-destruct unless Congress renewed its basic authorization. Uh, fortunately, that's exactly what Congress did. <laughs> and as we'll see, it's not like they were doing a great job necessarily back then and it was like, wow, let's give these guys more power. Because under bullet number four there, you see... By October 1979, the CFTC had it expanded to more than 500 employees. <laughs> How many CFTC employees does it take to screw in a light bulb while they ignore the silver manipulation? <laughs> come on, that was funny. Come on, come on. That was funny. Who thought that was funny? Come on. Ah, thank you, Samer B, for laughing your ass off. <laughs> I've got more, so be careful about encouraging me. So anyway, five, 500 employees led by four commissioners who served by presidential appointment with Senate confirmation. Always encouraging when presidential appointment and Senate confirmation are involved. Certainly the great check and balance. That could never go wrong. 
Although, I would say the check and balance on the CFTC, the President, and the Senate is once again my man Paul. All right, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna I'm gonna sidetrack. I know some of that some of you that freaks you out. But there's Paul, my man. I love this guy. I wonder. Uh, Jeez, I'm not sure that Paul would still be alive. If he is, man, would that be great to talk to him. Although, fortunately, I can read. <laughs> still got still got a couple more of Paul's books to go. Jimmy Carter. Uh, oh, I'm sure he'll factor in on this one before all is said and done. Um, I mean, it's amazing the political names that come up and that what we've learned about some of these guys since then. And... But let me continue on with, this is the money line. Because paragraph next one, about the most charitable thing that could be said about the commission was that in its short life, it had failed to win the confidence of the professional traders it was supposed to regulate. In protecting the public against fraud, it was about as effective as the administration's anti-inflation program. <laughs> D I got to go back to another Paul's money line. On top of being a great silver expert, look at the way he writes. As the 12 cylinder motor purred its song of power, a single sentence echoed repeatedly through this silver bull's mind. I can't believe how much money I'm making. I can't believe how much money I'm making. Um, by the way, interesting, he's referring to Norton Waltuch here. If you see, you go here, moreover, the media, especially the Wall Street Journal, had greatly enhanced his reputation by reporting that his mere appearance on the exchange floor actually caused the price of silver to soar. I had always been, I've heard of that story before. I had always heard that it was the Hunt brothers that caused that to occur. But um, so this was the first I've learned about Norton, although he seems to be a key figure. Another little side note. They were mentioning several times that the trading occurred in the World Trade Center. I don't know if that was still the case by September 11th, although I'm going to see if I can find this out. When I think back sometimes of how I got into finance and trading, I do remember that in grade school I took a field trip and we stopped at, we saw some trading floor in the World uh, Trade Centers. Man, I wonder if it was silver. That would be pretty wild. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's just some thoughts here. Nothing important. If you have something to do, go do it. But if you want to drink a coffee and talk silver history, then uh, Stephen Martin says, did Bix give you any theta? No, he did not. Although, uh, what a wonderful weekend. Uh, I know Bix is a little bit out there for some of you, but what a great guy. And, and I always look at it, anyone that's bringing attention to these issues you know you don't have to agree i don't know and you don't have to listen to him or me or anyone but um he was a great teacher for me and i think he's done a lot in helping people like me and the others that are doing it today be be there so anyway um and that's fine you don't have to like everyone that's okay it's all right I'm learning to handle it. I'm sure he can handle it. We had a great time. And anyway, let's continue on. A major problem lay with the leadership. No, come on. In government, that's... No, that can't... Paul's kidding. Must be kidding there. The first chairman appointed by President Nixon. A little sidebar there. You know, we are talking about a guy who is known as Tricky Dick... And uh, amongst other things, and was a U.S. president, so <laughs> you know, it's just that is what it is, I suppose. So anyway, Tricky Dick appointed William Bagley, a Washington lawyer, with a taste for seeing his name in the headlines. So, I mean, there's two sentences guaranteeing that we're getting honest, unbiased regulation right off the bat. Soon after the commission began operating in 1975, this impartial referee was quoted as declaring, all the New York exchanges should be closed up. <laughs> well, actually, he sounds better than Rostin, Benham, or Gensler. <laughs> Come on, get some laughter in the chat room. I thought that was quite clever. And if you 
If you didn't go for that one, I don't know what else I'll really be able to offer here today, but... Oh, yes, LBMA fesses to an accounting error. Oh, 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 doctor, we will be revisiting that one today. And there's another shocking story I was sent this morning regarding the same, very same CFTC, which we will cover too. Um, thank you for some laughter and chuckle out there. I appreciate that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, if you think that's funny, wait to see the other story about the CFTC. I'm not going to tell you yet. I'm going to tease you. But anyway, Commission's Vice Chairman John Rainbolt was responsible for implementing a congressional directive to create an exchange-traded market in commodity options. <laughs> During the agency, the first five years of the agency's operation, he made four trips to London to learn how the responsible and effective British system for option trading works. So again, they were guessing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not... I'm just saying I traded options. And they had to get me, but like, you know, just the idea of someone who's actually done it from that side. Because there's a degree to which I understand it's hard for lawyers to be able to like unravel through this stuff. I mean, that's why <laughs> on their second fact-finding trick, he explained why the CFTC intended to ban those options to protect the public. Does that mean that now that they're back, the public is not protected? Um I'm getting pretty good with my silver options expiration track record. I missed by a couple hours last month, but... <laughs> um, despite the C CFTC's shaky beginning, Congress said, hey, let's tack on some more. However, Price, uh, President Carter did not reappoint the chairman and vice chairman, and they returned to private practice of the law. Well, there is another familiar pattern. Acting with characteristic speed, President Carter appointed a new chairman, Harvard-trained economist, James Stone, then only 31 years old. So someone who just finished up his MBA, had about as much useful experience as Bernanke even after the end of his career. But see there you got there, James Stone. If you go onto the channel and search for Silver Thursday, I've uploaded that video and James Stone is the one talking about how, basically, they were crapping their pants back then. Um, the guy was 31 years old, and I'll add... I, don't, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm saying these things to brag, because that's really not... But, I mean, it's just the fact that I had trading experience, then I studied the economics side. Because there's a difference between the two, and there's a reason why academics are usually not good traders, and... You know, it wasn't the most cuddly period of my life, but I'm grateful I got that training. And, you know, and here we have economists and lawyers who don't understand. Um, and, hey, I'm not saying just that I'm the only trader who gets this. That's why I bring other people on the show. And there are other, fine, pick your own people to ask. But, I don't know, go watch James Stone talking about Silver Thursday. See how it worked out for him then and if we're really much better off. Um, yeah, and there's another LBMA. <laughs> uh, all right, I can't, I can't wait till we do the video for that. I got to say, basically, the LBMA said last night that when they, could, when they reported how much metal that they had in the LBMA vaults in Mar at, on their March count, which I guess covered the silver squeeze period, they were off by about 116 million ounces. Ha! Huh, oops. <laughs> Record-setting uh, amount of metal almost blows their doors off, and they forgot to count it. They mentioned it a couple months later. Okay. We'll see what the CFTC says about that. I don't know if they monitor that kind of thing. But the new CFTC chairman liked to conduct his business against a background of classical music, and after greeting a visitor, would play some Mozart record on the turntable before getting down to business. But even Mozart was of little solace to a man responsible for regulating the CFTC industry at a time when its very foundations were being threatened by a gathering crisis in silver. Under pressure, Stone became visibly strained and took medical leave for six weeks, returning on October 12th. Responsibility for monitoring the silver situation fell to another commissioner, Reed Dunn. And we'll leave Reed aside for now, but... I mean, hopefully what's coming across here is that what's happening now, it's not an accident. It's not the first time it happened. I mean, I'll, I'll sit here and read the whole darn book if I have to. I mean, but you get the idea. 
I mean, overlooking evidence. These aren't new themes. And it's like, at what point... I was talking with Kranzler last night about the LBMA thing, and I, I'm, I, like, I almost can't believe that. I'll, so I won't get into it now. We'll have a separate video, because that is so absolutely stunning. It's like, okay, at what point is there some consequence? I mean, that was a big misreporting of the data. Like Jeff Curry, all right, if there's some way he wasn't lying, that's a big error still, given the licensing, the brand, the influence in the market. And I find I was walking, getting breakfast, thinking about Silver Go Figure. <laughs> and I was thinking, it's like, Rostin Benham, you coward. All this stuff is happening. All these people have contacted your office. Look at your damn Twitter feed. And you still can't even speak for yourself. Give me a break. You had the gall to say transparency. I miss, I think his thing, his speech was yesterday. I'm, I, I wonder if he, con if, he, if he mentioned that. In fact, I'll go, uh, I'll go look that up. That would be pretty darn interesting to... And his, on the CFTC page, it says his tenure ends in June, next month. <laughs> go ahead. I, don't, I would pay silver for him to, get to see him go to Goldman Sachs. Is he going to comment on any of this? He hasn't tweeted lately. I think the last time he tweeted was congratulating Gary Gensler. So... You know, I know some people take the approach of let's wait the government to do the right thing. Uh, I have some other ideas. In fact, I'll leave you with this one and then I'll uh, maybe have a coffee and get ready to cover some of these other shocking stories. I'm going on my cell phone today because I left my chargers back in Austin and uh, I'm supposed to do an interview this afternoon. Will he be able to do it with 18% battery power? We'll find out. Um, <laughs> but I'll get you the silver, whatever it takes. And on this one, it's interesting here where the Hunts went on trial. Not do you will not believe who it was when you when you hear that. Um, but it's interesting because now there's a legal precedent for everything. And let me say this: this trial was about as vague as is typical with U.S. commodity laws. We're finding out. And if you think about, well, what specifically did they cite that they found the Hunt brothers guilty of? Then when you start thinking about how much fun it would be to have an online party and everyone can contribute and put their own piece of evidence of how J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and the CFTC are doing the exact same things and more. <laughs> it's, it's fun for your lawyer to get your tickets before they sell out. And I'll break another scoop while we're on here for all the people who stayed to minute 1830. I'm actually going to broadcast the trial on the Arcadia Network. Not the U.S. government trial. I'm just going to make my own. Maybe we'll even make costumes just for added theatrical bonus. Uh, you know, and we'll see. I don't know if Jeff Curry wants to show up. Fine. If not, we'll just uh, present the evidence, discuss it, and... I don't know, maybe that's really the way to prepare for life after the dollar and all this nonsense, because if the legal and regulatory system is incapable of acting in a way that deserves respect, then uh, I'm not going to waste my time with it anymore. I'm not going to go shoot anyone either. I don't believe in any of that stuff, but, you know, uh, I mean... I don't really care what the Fed does at this point. I mean, there's part of me that cares because I think it's sad that they, well, they don't even have an oath to betray, but I think I'm done with it, you know? I don't need the CFTC to tell me what's going on in silver. And I'm guessing you don't either. I don't need the COMEX, that fraud box. We'll get to that. Paul wrote about them. I don't need them to uh, tell me what the price of silver is. I have people I can call for that. And I think it's darn exciting that there's actually a group actively creating a physical index.
It actually is the, based on the physical price. Because I know a lot of you have asked about that. How come there's not something like that? And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm excited has uh, been forming because there's a group has been created. There's a good fellow who's spearheaded that. A lot of people uh, have written in and gotten connected with him. A lot of bullion dealers, mining companies. So the CFTC can do whatever. Who cares? They can say something. They can defend themselves. They can tamp it down. I am going to go with free market entrepreneurship and actually what capitalism really is, not the fraudulent socialist disguised mafia economy that we have here. But I think it's time that the true free market capitalist entrepreneurs not even fight back, but just reclaim... Uh, Oh my goodness, Kyle Wagner says Jeff Christian is live right now on the Silver CPM yearbook. Although, as amusing as I do find that certain days, fortunately, I'm getting better at realizing, well, there's some value in seeing what he's up to. Um, I'm going to maintain focused on what is important going ahead in restoring integrity and honor to the silver price. Uh, Gee, it's interesting to think once that's done, what could be possible in terms of uh, some honor and integrity to a lot of areas of life. And uh, anyway, so we'll wrap up for today, but not or for now. <laughs> but I'll be back because there was some other great news. Can't wait to cover it. So hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. If you enjoyed this one and think your homies should see it, hit the share button as well. And with that said, hope you're having a silvery morning and I will see you again shortly.